Good evening, Jupiter Station. I'm TJ Esnack. I'm the host of the Jupiter Station podcast. And tonight, our special guest is going to be Melinda Snodgrass. Uh, due to some unforeseen technical difficulties, let's go straight to Melinda. Hi, Thaddeus. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thanks for taking time out of your schedule to see us today. Sure. Uh, so I've just got a few questions, and I know you're a very busy lady tonight, so I'll be brief. Um, can you give us a brief introduction for people who might not be completely familiar with you? Um, sure. I'm a recovered lawyer uh, turned writer many, many years ago. Um, I started out as a novelist, um, and then my friend George R. R. Martin suggested that uh, I do pretty well in Hollywood, so I... Um, I wrote a spec script, which ultimately was bought by Star Trek and um, filmed, and uh, then I was hired on the show. Uh, it was called The Measure of a Man, um, fairly well-known episode. Um, I worked on Trek for half of the second season, all of the third season, and then I went on to work on some other shows like Reasonable Doubts and Profiler. and. Um, I so I write novels, I do television, and occasionally I write a movie. So that's that's me. Um, and I have this legal background behind me as a you know somebody who studied law and practiced for three years and then realized I didn't really like it. And I love being a writer. So, well, that's awesome. You go with what makes you feel happy, and I'm sure that's very much what you've done. Um, one of your most acclaimed works is, as you mentioned, uh, The Measure of a Man. Can you give us an idea of the thought process while you were writing it? Well, my uh, specialty in law school was constitutional law. Um, and I was fascinated by it, loved all of my classes, whether it was criminal, um, criminal procedure, which is sort of a version of con constitutional law, and then also my constitutional law classes. And um, when George had approached me about writing a spec script, um, I had this idea. I realized as I was watching the show that first season that I found Data to be a fascinating character. And, um, and I realized that I could potentially take an infamous Supreme Court decision um, called Dred Scott, and I could use that case, I could apply it to Data. And the Dred Scott decision was about um, a slave owner who took his slave into a free territory. And the slave then said, well, I'm in a free territory now, I'm a free man. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and, and the Supreme Court ruled that he was not in fact a person, he was property. And so he was returned to his master. Um, and that got me thinking that, you know, Data is a toaster. I mean, he's a machine. So could he possibly be viewed as property of Starfleet Command rather than an individual in his own right? And that was where the whole idea came from. And, and this is why when I teach, um, when I lecture classes, I always tell kids, um, whatever it is you're studying, you're going to use it if you become a writer. It doesn't matter um, what the subject is, uh, it will be something that you will use in your work. I've used my law, my law background, uh, the fact I'm a dressage writer, the fact I studied opera in Europe, all of these things have come into what I write about, whether it's in novels or in screenplays. Awesome. Um... So have you been a fan of Star Trek since the original series or was it fairly new to you yes, when you made your... I, um, I'm, I'm not that young. <laughs> so when I was a kid, mm. when a kid, um, Star Trek was on TV and I fell in love. I've always loved science fiction. Um, it's my favorite, favorite thing to read from the time I was a little girl up till now still. Um, and so I had loved Trek and... Uh, so it was an easy, I mean, when George offered me the chance to write a spec script and then he would show it to his agent uh, at the time, um, you know, I looked at what was out there and I just thought that uh, writing for Trek looked like fun. And so I just watched some of the episodes over and over. And I'd done a lot of acting too. So I, I sort of would practice how the characters were delivering their dialogue 
um, and then try to incorporate that into the writing. Uh, you know, that's one of the things about a good, successful television writer is you have to sort of be a minor bird. You have to be able to, to um, create an echo how the characters speak in, in a really, you know, clear way. Um, so I did that. And, uh, and then I wrote my script and George showed it to his agent and his agent sent it to Trek and they bought it. <laughs> so that's how it worked. Um, but I can give advice on that's not how it works today. Now, if you want to break into writing for the industry, writing for television or movies, um, you don't write for a show that's already on the air like I did. Now they want to see your original work and the things you're interested in doing. So the thing I always advise people is um, you should write a spec feature film. You should write your own TV pilot you know, the pilot of your own TV series idea and have those as your calling card rather than writing for a show that is already uh, on the air and, and, uh, and going. It's just, it's a different world now than when I broke in. And that's a perfect segue um, for my next question. Uh, with the recent labor dispute between SAG-AFTRA and the WGA, uh, is there anything the world learned by watching news coverage of the strikes? Well, I, I think, um, I mean, I've, I've been a proud member of the Writers Guild of America West uh, ever since I sold that first script. And I think it shows that the, there's, there's a power in unionization where, you know, um, together we're more powerful than alone. And so I think it was, um, I think it was great. And I think in some ways, you know, we, we, we set the, the, the bar. And then, of course, we had the it followed suit with the um, uh, with the auto workers, um, and uh, you know I, I just think that unionism has great power um, to give people. I mean, it's it's sort of like in some ways like the law. I mean, there's a reason we require a defendant to have representation because that's a single individual up against the power of the state, and. And in, in business, a single individual has a much harder time standing up against the power of a, you know, enormous corporation. And so when we can work together, um, speak as with one voice, and it was really thrilling when the actors joined us. Um, and so that was, pardon me, I have to kill this. Um, sorry, somebody's calling me. I'll have to call them back. Um, anyway, um, you know, when the actors joined us, that gave us just that much more power um, to protect ourselves against the changes in technology, primarily AI. Um, what I mean, small writers' rooms were an issue, but the AI thing was really, really what we all had to address. So, yeah, I've I've seen a number of things from Chat GPT, and it really makes me wonder how that would even be feasible, given just how wide of, of a span that thing will throw at you. Well, and, and it's interesting because um, there is a, a website where you can check and see if your novels are being used to train AI. And in fact, um, five of my novels are there are being used to, but I'm not getting paid while they're using my creativity to teach their device. Um, and what we were worried about in the business was that that uh, studios or networks would say, okay, well, we want a rom-com. Hey, ChatGPT, write us a rom-com. It wouldn't be good, but it would be there. And then they would turn to a real writer and say, here, fix this, but we're going to pay you a much smaller amount of money because you're just doing a rewrite. Um, and, you know, there's, I mean, in some ways, Measure of a Man is about, um, you know, the power of, what makes people unique? And I just think that at this point, AI is not there where it can be as creative, as emotionally evocative as something created by a human being. So. And I, I was just reading an article about that where um, quite a few of the writers in Hollywood, both Trek writers and other producer uh, production writers were saying that you couldn't get that quality writing with AI. It has to absolutely be a human. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. AI just isn't there yet. I mean, it can mimic, but it can't, um, it, it, it can't really talk about what makes fiction great, which is, you know, the human heart in conflict with itself. Um, and those are ephemeral ideas, you know, not something that as yet a machine can duplicate. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to shift back to Trek for just a minute here. Um, but would you consider writing an episode or two if a new Star Trek show were produced? Uh, and has anyone reached out to ask if you'd write for Strange New Worlds or Lower Decks? Um, I would be open to it, but no, they have not. And uh, there was a conscious effort on the part of this sort of new um, regime that came in at CBS that they didn't really want any of the old guard. They didn't really want any of us um, who had worked on earlier shows to be involved. Um, and I'll admit, Trek was a very difficult show. I have very mixed feelings about it, um, but I'm a writer and I like to work. So, you know, if somebody came to me, um, I would certainly be open to it, <laughs> let's put it that way. But it doesn't seem like that's something that is in the cards because they have made a decision. They they want to go with a younger, different group of writers than those of us who were on the older shows. So that's how it Which is. Which I believe is probably why it was good that t that uh, Terry Metalis was the showrunner for season three, especially because he was able to kind of kind of sneak the old guard in without actually having the old guard in. Because from what I've seen, it was a love letter to Trek. the The last season was absolutely he was a fan. Of which which show? I, I mean, I I have a terrible confession to make. Oh. I, I haven't watched any of the new. Track shows. So. Um, season three of Star Trek Picard. So that was basically um, Terry got the band back together. So everybody came back 20 years after Star Trek First Contact. Okay. And they all came back together. And um, it was funny because one of the locations, they actually named it Metalis 4. And then you come to find out he was actually a production assistant on Enterprise. So he's been a fan literally his entire life, and here he is running the show. Okay, well, um, I wish them well, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing other things now, so developing well, different shows. Um, I can definitely say I have a newfound appreciation for A Measure of a Man. I never once even thought it was part of the Supreme Court case, but now that really makes a connection for me. Well, um, you know, we we do carry these sort of you know issues of humanity that we discuss periodically over and over again. So, you know, it's a timeless topic, I think. And I've got two last questions, and then I'll let you go because I'm sure you you're busy. Um, Star Trek believes in the tenets of infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Um, how do you see those tenets interwoven in your Trek writings? Uh, I think that's the bedrock of Trek. I mean, if you go back to the original show, I mean, it was the 1960s. We were in the middle of the Cold War. Um, people, you know, kids doing duck and cover and getting under their desks. And yet Star Trek had, um, you know, a black woman in a position of authority, a Russian on the, on the bridge, um, an Asian um, gentleman. I mean, all of this was presenting a view of the world that was not all that common, you know, in 1966. Um, and I think Trek has tried to keep that view of, of I mean, Trek has always been political. Uh, people who, you know, complain about, you know, why are they doing all these political things in Trek? It's like, have you not watched Trek? It's always been political. Um, and so I think that it, it, it speaks to our aspiration to be a better society, um, a more diverse, a more inclusive society. And those are nice, those are nice messages to, to have out there. I mean, that's the beauty of science fiction. Science fiction can present difficult issues in a safe space so that people can contemplate things and go, 
well, wait a minute, you know, maybe my attitudes toward uh, people of different races or LGBTQ plus community is, doesn't make a lot of sense, but I, I'm not having it in my face because it's being presented in this sort of arm's length way with science fiction. And I think that's one of the, the strengths of the genre and maybe why I've loved it ever since I learned to read, you know, it was where I wanted to be. And I, I couldn't agree more with that. Honestly, a very large chunk of my worldview has been through the eyes of Star Trek. Um, I, I joke a lot with, with my family here, my friends, um, that when I grew up, I wanted to be Captain Kirk. <laughs> and looking back on it, I'm really the emergency medical hologram. <laughs> when, when I'm not podcasting or working as a school bus driver, I'm a firefighter and an EMT. Oh, and wow. there, there have been plenty of plenty of calls I've gone on where I look at my partner and my partner looks at me and says, um, please state the nature of your medical emergency. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. Right. And your last question. Well, that was absolutely my last question. I thank oh, you so yes. much for being with us tonight. Um, People who are going to see this are going to see it actually on Sunday because I'm taping it so I can get all my post-production stuff done and things like that. Um, but I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk with us. And I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Take care. Awesome. Have a good evening. You too. Have a great night. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye-bye. And in other Trek news, um, Nicole DeBoer is scheduled, slated to return to Star Trek. Um, she'll be reprising her role as Esri Dax in the 31st season of Star Trek Online. Uh, it's going to be made available uh, January 23rd for the PC version and will launch on the Xbox and PlayStation platforms starting on March 12th. Uh, more news on this can be found um, at giantfreakingrobot.com. Um, it's going to be a short show tonight, folks, but I really appreciate you guys tuning in. I'm glad that we were able to have uh, Melinda Snodgrass join us tonight. We're going to be doing this every week. Um, but I'd like to touch base real quick, uh, give you guys some background on me. Um, I've been a Star Trek fan since I was 10. I love Star Trek, the original series, the next generation. I'm going to be the unpopular opinion. If it says Trek, I like it. Um, I'm still on the fence about Abrams' Trek. Um, I am a parent. I work full time. As you heard me tell Melinda, I'm a local first responder. So I definitely have no shortage of things to do. Um, I'm also a member of Starfleet, the International Star Trek Fan Association. Um, literally everything that is important in my life in one way or another spans from Star Trek, and I'm really looking forward to bringing a lot of this to you folks right here. Um, we're available starting midnights on Sunday on the YouTube platform and anywhere you can catch your podcast. Uh, once again, I'm TJ Esnack. This is Jupiter Station, and wishing you a great night, and we'll see you next week.